Good morning. Welcome to this morning's call with the offices of Minnesota Governor Tim Walls and Lieutenant Governor Flanagan. I'm John Pratt, Executive Director of the Minnesota Council of Nonprofits, and we're grateful to sponsor this opportunity to hear directly from administration leaders, including Governor Tim Walls, Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan, and Mark Majors, Director of the Employment and Training Programs Division at the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development. Uh, we'll be joined by the governor at about 1135. We have 500 participants registered for the second of four weekly briefings with the governor's office. When this call was announced, we put out a call for questions and MCN's public policy director, Marie Ellis and Ileana Mieja organized the questions, uh, shared them with the governor's office. And later on, Marie will facilitate our Q&A conversation. We have about uh, one hour for the call and our agenda is to first hear directly from the governor about the current situation and then share an outline of nonprofit impacts and what MCN has heard from our members about what is still needed. Lieutenant Governor Flanagan will provide an overview of the state's relief package and what the office of the governor and lieutenant governor are prioritizing for the next state package. Mark Majors from DEED will give an overview of what DEED is prioritizing uh, and certainly they're dealing with some of the big issues around unemployment compensation uh, and filing, processing unemployment claims. Uh, please note that the governor has a very tough schedule and we'll need to move on to another call partway through. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan and Mark Majors will remain on this call to make further comments and respond to questions. And then the final section will be a Q&A using the questions submitted previously. Each of these weekly calls will be recorded and available with a link afterward. And we will also include links to some developing issues at MCN's COVID-19 page. So I think we're ready and I'll turn it over to you, Governor Walls. Thank you, John. And uh, good morning to everyone. And uh, thank each and every one of you. As I, as I said last night, Minnesotans are hardworking folks. And uh, I was speaking directly to the folks on this line too and we know that uh, the organizations that each of you lead up and the things that we built to underpin a quality of life for all minnesotans is uh is absolutely critical to uh to getting us through this and we also know that the stress of this is falling heavily on you and your organization so i i just uh i appreciate all you do and i'm uh i'm cognizant of the pressure that each of you are under to continue to do what is is so important but uh, I know for one thing we need you now um, your servant leaders your problem solvers and your partners of the uh, of the highest caliber and we're going to need you so uh, uh, lieutenant governor and I are are honored to be on this call with you we want to just update you a little bit of where we're at I I chose to not use last night's address to uh, to do some of the detail work we've been doing it in our two o'clock afternoons and I think it's probably more important to put uh, folks like uh, Lieutenant Governor and Mark on um, to be able to answer some of your specific questions. We're doing that with a lot of different uh, partners. So uh, we know that the uh, the biggest thing we're trying to do is, especially in this, is those most vulnerable to make sure that uh, we're getting resources into their hands as quickly as possible. And and the folks uh, over at Deed have done incredible work. And I, I will not. Um, I, I need to make sure I'm continuously thanking them for what they do, but they know that until we get every single person taking care of our jobs, not done. But as I just got off the call with a lot of other governors, there are a few states that are handling the volume the way Minnesota has. And there's few states that um, are continuing with the leadership that's happening over at Deed and with the feedback we're getting from folks like you. Uh, today, I'm going to issue an executive order that, that opens up that UI to about 45,000 more people. Uh, probably would have taken a month uh, under the normal channels to get there. We're going to we're going to do that immediately. We know that in the absence of of being able to uh, get rid of mortgages or get rid of rent, uh, what we can do is make sure we put a freeze on evictions and then that we replaced as much of that income as we possibly could. Um, we also know that poses some uh, challenging issues that come up at times, and we're really trying to grapple with this six hundred dollars additional payment on the top. Um, that's coming from the federal government, which is good news. Uh, technologically wise, everybody worked over the weekend and, and we're, I think, probably the first state that's up and ready to do it. But it also then 
sometimes comes in conflict with other existing rules and other programs. And we need to continue to hear from you, continue to hear workarounds um, to make sure that people's basic needs, um, housing, safety, security, food, and their children are, are where we're really focusing. So we're up to about 325,000 folks um, in Minnesota on unemployment insurance. This 45,000 should add relatively quickly. Um, We'll see this week probably how much that plateaus out. We'll be making decisions later in the the week about the extension of, of the stay-at-home order, which I think most of you understand is, is necessary. Um, we're trying to be smart about it. We're trying to use the science of slowing the, the spread of COVID-19, but we're also trying to be uh, smart about how we can get folks back into activities that are safe or allow them to do things that they continue to uh, need to be able to to function, which exercise outside or other things like that. Uh, we're working really closely with the legislature. I think you probably, many of you saw, they're going to come back in for a very quick session tomorrow. We were able to get a compromise on workmen's, uh, workers comp around our first responders. I'm very pleased um, that they were able to do it together. I was certainly ready to take executive action on it, but I think it bodes better for what bodes better for the state when we're able to work together, when we're able to find that compromise. They're able to send it through the regular order and I'm able to sign it. Uh, on the 14th, they'll be coming back again for a bigger session. We have put together uh, a robust package that the state can do, uh, specifically around COVID-19. Uh, Mark and the Lieutenant Governor can maybe spend a little more time on some of the things that are in there, but it's it's suggestions that we paid, uh, we put out before that were not accepted and need to move through the legislature, like rent support, um, MFIP uh, bump ups to those families. So there's a lot of things that we still have the capacity to do. And, and we're hoping that with some uh, encouragement to the legislature from the folks on this call, we can get that package through and have a direct impact on, on much of what you're doing. So uh, again, I'm grateful. Um, I'm hopeful, but I, as I said last evening, I think most of you who, who see the data, it's going to get a little rougher before it gets better. The good news is we've had a little more lead time and some great collaboration and cooperation from uh, a large part of the state has given us the time and the resources I, to, to weather this thing better than had we not. So I'm super grateful for that. And I think, John, I'll turn it back over to you before, uh, before the Lieutenant Governor takes over. Great. Thank you, Governor Walls, and thank you also for your your both your personal and direct messages last night to the people of the state of Minnesota. And I, I know I've heard from a number of people, people being proud that, and actually uh, feeling much safer knowing that they're in Minnesota, a state that can be so responsive. Uh, MCN helps sponsor, participate in the uh, Unemployment Compensation Advisory Committee, and we've seen sort of how highly tuned that system is. Obviously, it's under stress now. And I, I think of this time is our, our supreme uh, ordeal to confront in the Joseph Campbell sense. Um, and of course, the nonprofit sector has been affected like other employers. Uh, we're seeing sort of the major layoffs, uh, closure of facilities. Um, and these organizations also share a keen interest in all the state and federal responses. So that uh, is also sort of key information about how it's going to work. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of focus now on the CARES Act. This past Friday was the first day that uh, employers uh, could apply for the uh, payroll protection forgivable loans, uh, and many organizations are in that process. We're co-sponsoring a, a training this Wednesday with Propel Nonprofits uh, and Sunrise Banks on how to apply for a payroll protection forgivable loan uh, and getting a lot of interest. Uh, there's a lot coming up, but I think at this point, I'll turn it over to Lieutenant Governor uh, Flanagan uh, to give an update on the overall package and administration response. Great, well, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, John, and, and thank you, Marie, and, and everyone who's, who's on this call today. Um, we are starting day one of distance learning in our home, so you may hear a little activity from a first grader uh, uh, during this call. So I uh, just want to forewarn everybody. Um, 
But I, I wanted to uh, just also um, say, I know that there's a lot of questions today, so I wanna try to keep my, um, my comments brief and then turn it over to my colleague from Deed, Mark Majors, to provide some of the specific information that, that your members are looking for. Um, but before we dive too deeply into the economic supports for businesses and individuals uh, underway at Deed, I wanted to also just highlight the, the topic of housing stability that the governor had touched on and what we're hoping that the state legislature will accomplish in the, in the coming week. Um, during this crisis, we're asking people to take action and stay at home to, to stop the spread of the virus, to buy us time. Uh, to prepare for uh, the, the securing of, of ventilators, uh, masks, um, and intensive care unit beds. Um, we felt that it was important for our collective public health for people to stay home, which we, means that, of course, we needed to stop people from being removed from their homes during to income insecurity caused by the economic slowdown related to COVID-19. Um, I'm proud that, that Governor Walls issued an executive order that established a moratorium on evictions so that people can be confident in their, in their housing uh, during this insecure time. However, uh, stopping evictions does not mean stopping rent or mortgage payments. We're asking people to work that out with their landlord um, when possible to pay their rent, even if it isn't the full amount in this moment. I know that with losses of jobs or hours that this is hard for families, which is why we're working hard to get people access to income supports like unemployment insurance payments uh, that the governor uh, that the governor discussed earlier. It's also why we are, we've proposed an increase to the family homeless uh, prevention and assistance program, which can be used uh, for rent or mortgage payments in our state supplemental budget. Uh, however, um, as many of you know, that this was this was not uh, adopted by the state legislature um, at that time. So a broad coalition of housing advocates, including tenants, landlords, and low-income homeowners have banded together to secure state resources for rental and mortgage assistance. The governor and I um, want to voice our support for their efforts and acknowledge uh, the need for really robust investment in this moment. And I would just put out a call to action to all of you on the phone to please reach out to your legislators uh, and ask them uh, to, to pass an increase in rental assistance uh, during this time. Um, while we have been able to halt uh, evictions, we need the legislature to step up and to do their part uh, to fund uh, rental assistance for folks um, across the state. It's a really important uh, proposal and we need the support of this network uh, in place so that the community can really, um, we can respond, but of course we can also look towards uh, recovery. Uh, the governor and I will continue to work with the state legislature to secure funding for resources needed to support housing stability uh, when they come back on April 14th, and we hope that you use your voice to do so as well. And again, just to echo, the unemployment insurance uh, that is available to folks is, uh, you know, needed to provide that economic stability so that people can continue to pay their rent and mortgage. But we also know the rental assistance is key, as well as, um, we have a proposal that the legislature did not pass, which I think is also critical for low-income families, which is um, a bump in uh, the Minnesota Family Investment Program and MFIP. Uh, so we could certainly use your advocacy uh, there during this time as well. So that's just a, a brief um, update uh, from us, but we've got uh, a little over a week uh, to get some of these things um, done at the legislature and just really want to call on all advocates on this call uh, to, to make your voices heard and, and to make it happen uh, with regards to this additional economic support uh, for families all across the state. So I'll turn it over now to uh, Mark for some opening comments from Deed and then I'll happily answer some questions from, um, from MCN members that we have as well. Um, we're okay, well, okay. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, and good morning, everyone. Um, as the governor mentioned, uh, we are working very hard uh, at the 
and looking at our unemployment uh, program and making sure that we are geared up to serve the citizens of Minnesota um, as quickly and as fast as we possibly can. Um, and on a, you know, for me as a director of employment and training programs, we are also uh, working with our partners to answer a lot of questions that have been um, that have been asked about uh, contracts, um, programs, delivering services to our uh, participants and the citizens of Minnesota. Um, we're looking at being flexible as we possibly can um, to ensure that services continue as well as through our career force locations, we're looking at possibilities of or avenues in terms of virtual services. So we are working really hard uh, during this unprecedented time to ensure that our partners are receiving information in a timely manner, that we're processing grants and contracts um, as quickly as possible and making payments um, as quickly as possible, because we know that those uh, funds are necessary for your, um, our partners to deliver services. Um, but I'll stop there um, and um, turn it back over to Lieutenant Governor um, for the remainder of the uh, call and jump in when necessary. And this Thanks is Marie. Much. Marie, did you want to do some questions for us? I do. Uh, everyone, this is Marie Ellis. I'm the Public Policy <clears throat> Director at Minnesota Council of Nonprofits. And so I think uh, everyone probably knows that we solicited some questions ahead of time from you all and put them together. Um, and there are quite a few. First of all, a very sincere thank you to our panelists today. We know it's an incredibly busy time for all of you. Um, Governor Walls said he's cognizant of the pressure that our sector is under. And I think we can reciprocate that. We are cognizant of the very intense pressure um, that all of our elected officials and, and staff are under as well. And it's really helpful for nonprofit sector advocates to hear directly from you. So thank you for doing that. Um, to everyone else on the call, if you heard the Lieutenant Governor mention all of you advocates on this call and thought, that's not me, I'm not an advocate, you are wrong. Uh, and, you, and you should definitely um, heed her advice and call your legislators because we all should do that as much as we can. Um, and I know that John mentioned this earlier, but for everyone on the call who submitted questions about how to apply for some of the federal funding, we do have a webinar coming up on Wednesday, that's in two days for everyone who has lost track of what day it is, um, with MCN and Propel for Nonprofits, and that's on how to apply for a Paycheck Protection Program loan. So I think that'll come in handy for a lot of folks. Okay, starting off the question, questions. Question number one, do you know of any centralized place where nonprofits or other organizations can get information about applying for funding that may be available through the CARES Act and the new dollars appropriated through state legislation? Uh, thanks for that question. And again, Marie, thank you for encouraging everyone to be an advocate. Uh, I want y'all to protect your your tax status uh, but remember as an individual you can do um, as much as as you want uh, in this in this moment and just encourage you uh, to to do so so in answer to your question um, at this point we do not have a, a centralized location where you, you can find all of the the new grant opportunities um, but for the opportunities that have been funded with state dollars, we've tried to, um, what we've tried to do is to make the applications easy to find and straightforward uh, to, to get dollars out quickly. Um, but to be clear, despite that intent, uh, that doesn't mean that we've been successful at each opportunity. Um, most of the CARES Act dollars, which might go out as, as grants, have not uh, yet come to the state. And we're still looking for, for guidance from the federal government uh, on some of the, the components. Uh, and just to be clear, I, I want to acknowledge that in this really difficult time, we are hearing your concerns about administrative burdens. Uh, and I will take this suggestion about creating a centralized location for COVID related grant opportunities uh, back to our agencies. We want um, to, to have things to, you know, be as accessible as, as possible and as easy to navigate uh, during this time. So it's a helpful suggestion uh, and, and I'll take it back and, and uh, try, to, try to see what you can do to get that moving forward. And again, of course, just continue to be in connection, um, you know, with John and Marie as, as these things do become available that we let you know right away so that you can apply. 
Excellent. Thank you. Next question is a big one, um, and it's regarding unemployment insurance specifically. The governor's executive order relieved tax paying employers of benefits charges associated with the pandemic so that their uh, unemployment insurance tax rate will not increase because of the pandemic and the benefits associated with it. That relief we welcome wholeheartedly um, and that's um, extremely appreciated by the nonprofits who use the state's UI tax system. But as I'm sure you both know, many nonprofits are self-insured for unemployment benefits. And so that relief I just mentioned does not apply to them. The Federal CARES Act passed last week, a week and a half ago, does appropriate funds to cover 50% of those direct UI benefit costs. This is the top issue that we've been hearing about from nonprofits statewide, many of which are genuinely concerned that they will be unable to pay their UI reimbursement bills from the state and need to close their doors. Uh, one questioner noted, the struggle to meet the demand of reimbursing a complete layoff of staff will cause some nonprofits to go under. So we're advocating very strongly at the federal level that the fourth stimulus package include 100% relief for reimbursing employers. But if that does not happen, do you anticipate any state relief for reimbursing employers? So thank you for that question. We, we're we still getting federal direction about the CARES Act and how that is going to uh, interact with, with state laws. Um, however, the, the federal legislation did include language to the effect that the federal government will pick up 50% of reimbursing employers reimbursements through December 31st of 2020. Um, that of course impacts uh, tribes, nonprofits, and government entities. The reimbursements um, are due quarterly for UI benefits, and um, the benefits for employees on UI benefits today will not be due until next quarter, which buys us a little bit of time. Um, in addition, the unemployment insurance program may statutorily suspend or waive interest or penalties accrued for any employer under Minnesota state statutes. Um, for you nerds out there, I'll read the, the statute number. It's 268.067. Um, it's likely that our department will choose to do this for reimbursing employers. Um, our agency has also has a compromise authority under um, that statute, which allows the department under parameters laid out in statute to waive uh, debt due to the, the UI trust fund. Um, so I just wanna just underscore that I understand that people are extremely concerned about this and deed is moving at really a breakneck speed on a number of these fronts to take action as quickly as possible. Uh, we encourage nonprofits to continue to reach out to our office to receive guidance on case specific questions. But I also just want to offer up that um, on an upcoming call, perhaps next week, I'll ask Commissioner Grove to also just join us to speak to this more directly. So, um, you know, we anticipate that uh, we will be able to um, uh, to to waive uh, debt uh, and those those penalties accrued. Um, but I want to make sure that we have the commissioner on here so you can you can hear from him directly as well. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, and I'll just note that we have spoken with Deed quite a few times about this, and I think. Um, they are working at breakneck speed and under great pressure and have been really clear that. Um, uh, number one goal, number one duty is to get unemployment checks out to people who are applying. Um, and I know That's that right. people have noted last week at a Senate hearing that in a two week span of time recently, the agency received as many applications for unemployment as they received in all of 2019. So we're definitely trying to keep that in mind as we work with DEED as well, um, knowing that they're totally swamped with work and are, and are really prioritizing things appropriately and also that uh, nonprofits are genuinely concerned about what's gonna happen. So trying to balance all those things. Absolutely. Next up, how can the state provide support to fill in gaps left by federal funding packages? Some examples that came up uh, were relief to nonprofits that have more than 500 employees, uh, nonprofits that are not C3 organizations, such as C4 welfare organizations and C6 associations that were left out. So that's a really good question uh, and, a, and a difficult question to, to answer. Um, because we are limited 
as a state in terms of what we can spend, we're really forced in this moment to focus on COVID-19 items. And most of our appropriations have gone towards uh, public health and, and healthcare preparations in this moment. In the, in the near term, we're looking to the federal government to recognize that their work is not done and to continue to build upon the first three COVID packages that they've passed. Um, however, it, we would invite you to continue to come to us with ideas about how we can provide relief to C4s and C6s because they're clearly an integral part of our nonprofit community. Um, we're not closing the door on taking action if we are able to do so and are, are thankful that we're, we're having calls uh, to, to hear about these concerns. So this is a moment where we would really look to um, uh, to leaders of C6s and C4s uh, to also give additional suggestions and, and guidance, and we'll continue to work with um, uh, with the Council of Nonprofits uh, to, to see if there's some solutions there. Excellent, and we'll continue to work on the federal level with that as well. Uh, let's see, can state agencies expedite payments to nonprofits on all contracts and grants, both for amounts that have already been submitted through their contract terms and for any new payment submissions? The questioner notes, nonprofits are reliant on sufficient cash flow to pay staff and maintain services. Even if not expedited, at least don't slow down. For sure. And as someone who has uh, run an organization that relied on uh, these these grant payments from uh, from the state, uh, I feel y'all and I just I really need you to know that. And, you know, we've been told by the Department of Administration that there's no issue contractually nor legally that would prevent payment earlier than the normal 30 day period. Um, however, there are some considerations of the ability from a, a staffing, just like a staffing perspective, uh, to be able to, to process those, those quickly. Um, my sense is that to a, a certain extent, they will have to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, you know, additionally, our uh, grant administrators are also being encouraged to allow flexibility. Um, for example, providing late reporting options so payments will not be delayed. Uh, DHS is also encouraging flexibility in, in modifying grants and contracts uh, to the extent allowable under state and federal law. Um, so we are encouraging our agencies to do this, to work with you as much as possible, and to try to get those dollars in your hands so that you can remain afloat and continue um, your, your work during this time. Uh, I just also would just encourage you to, to reach out to agencies and ask them for their guidance on what might be possible to get dollars flowing uh, towards your organizations. But again, just to, to let you know that the governor and I have been very clear uh, that we want um, our agencies to be as, as flexible as possible uh, under uh, state and federal law to, to get you the dollars that you need. So please continue to ask, um, ask questions, and uh, we'll do as much as we can to, to, to answer those appropriately and get you the dollars. And I think um, those of us who were on the call last week heard that loud and clear from uh, Commissioner Jody Harpstead as well, that she was committed to providing as much flexibility as possible. Uh, this gets back to something we were chatting about a little bit earlier. We have heard the governor mention 330 million for food shelves, social services, et cetera. Where do we find this funding in order to apply? So on March 26th, um, the legislature approved a, a large bill totaling that $330 million, and there were several components to the bill, um, much of, of which will not go out as competitive grants. Uh, the, the single largest item is the, the $200 million COVID response fund, and this is a, a flexible fund that will allow us to move resources quickly. Um, so for example, the first approved expense uh, out of that fund was for personal protective equipment um, when an opportunity arose. Uh, the largest items uh, passed that are being distributed as new grants are the $30 million in uh, emergency child care grants. That application deadline is, is April 15th and is available on childcareaware.org. And there's detailed uh, eligibility and requirement information that is also available on that website. 
uh, $26.5 million for the emergency services program to help fund COVID-19 related activities for people who are experiencing homelessness. And these grants are to support uh, staffing, to procure sanitary supplies, um, and, and also space. And that application and detailed description of allowable uses is available at Heading Home Alliance. Dot com. And I'm assuming that, Marie, you will also be able to share these uh, links uh, with, with folks who are, on, who are on the call as well. Yep. yep, I think I'm guessing that Sandra is putting them in the chat right now. And if not, we'll make sure we do that right after. Great. So Child Care Aware and then Heading Home Alliance uh, dot com. Great. Thank you. Um, that was a really helpful quick rundown of what was in that $330 million. A couple of workforce related questions. Will there be any additional funding to help dislocated workers get career and training services to re-enter the workforce post COVID-19? Lieutenant Governor, I, I think, can Yeah, I think Mark, I'm gonna have you take that one. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, as most of you know that the state's dislocated uh, worker resources come from the Workforce Development Fund, as well as uh, we receive federal uh, WIOA funding uh, from our programs. Our dislocated worker team uh, remains active in assisting dislocated workers um, through our partners, as well as through our career force locations that remain open with assisting individuals who are displaced. Um, we've been providing additional information about available work um, to displaced workers as they are um, employers who give us that, provide us that information. Um, additionally, our team is planning uh, to do some additional enhancements to our career force locations, including offering virtual career affairs um, to folks. Right now, it's unclear uh, where the pandemic um, will end and, the down and, if, and if there is a downturn and what resources may be available to enhance our current capacity to support dislocated workers. So no clear answer to will there be additional funding as it is possible that Congress may provide additional resources through WIOA. So we are, we are definitely waiting um, to hear um, from Congress in terms of if there will be additional funding towards workforce, um, but know that we do have a pretty healthy at this point in time, a healthy uh, state dislocated worker program. Um, and we are trying to be as flexible as we possibly can. As you know, the state dislocated worker program is um, overseen by the um, MJSP board, um, who will definitely be looking at the balances um, and, and considering actions uh, next steps uh, for the um, with those fund with the state funds. So our teams are looking uh, to be creative and to be strategic as we can with these resources uh, where we do have a space. Um, and so we are, um, but on the federal side, we are definitely waiting to hear back from uh, hear from Congress what the next steps are. Sure, that makes good sense. Thank you. Um, it's good to hear that the program is healthy right now. Uh, the next question is very specific. Young parents who lost near full-time restaurant work must quit school to access unemployment insurance. We're hearing from homeless youth across the state who believe getting the UI payment is more important to their families than continuing with distance learning. What is your advice for these parents? So Mark, I'm gonna jump in here uh, in here first. Um, so this is a, this is a heartbreaking situation. Um, and the impacts and, and consequences of this virus are uh, enormous. Uh, and you know this COVID-19 has unfortunately shown um, many new people, uh, what others in our state have known for a long time. That the systems that we've built to support those who are struggling um, often don't work in the way that we need them to work and often ask people to make completely unfair and impossible choices. You all know uh, that, um, you know, the value that our administration places on education. So it is very difficult for me to say that they should forego distance learning. Um, 
you know, we we know that uh, that this will only um, make folks fall further and further behind. Uh, but when, you know, if, if I'm being honest, there is no good advice to give to this family because their overall situation is unacceptable. Uh, you know, I guess that's why I will ask everyone on this, this call um, to ask the same question of themselves and more importantly to ask what they can do to support these students and their families. I'll ask the same thing uh, when we have our, our call with foundations uh, on Wednesday um, and when I talk to the, the members of the People of Color and Indigenous Caucus and, and uh, leaders in the House and Senate uh, on, on Thursday. I've seen a lot of people, and I'm sure you've you've also seen this online or in conversations with folks who've said that COVID-19 is the great equalizer, and it's not. That's crap. Um, all of us are being impacted, uh, but we are not all being impacted in the same way. And so the same disparities and, um, frankly, just lack of support uh, for our most vulnerable Minnesotans, uh, those are being exacerbated by uh, this virus. And so uh, I know that and the governor knows that and we're trying to do everything we can uh, to uh, to try to make it right. And sometimes even people in power feel powerless in this situation. So we'll just ask you for um, your continued advocacy. We will be having these conversations again with foundations and with um, the legislature uh, to, to figure out how to best respond, but I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer for you now. Um, Mark, I'm not sure if you have anything to to uh, to share here. Um, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. Yeah, um, I just wanted to add, um, so we are currently um, w awaiting further details about the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. Um, but the direction that we've received from DLL um, at this time indicates that this program is for those who would be unable to access the regular UI program. As we receive further direction for this new and entirely federal, uh, federally funded program, it seems likely that this population alongside folks who participate in the gig economy and the self-employed will be able to access benefits from the new PUA program. Right now, the state is in the process of building this new program. However, uh, Congre Congress created the program, um, but each state is required to build their own program. And while we're waiting, for, so we're waiting, currently waiting for further details uh, from DOL on the specifics. Um, we believe recipients of the new PUA program will also receive the federal $600 a week top up to their benefits making this helpful uh, financial tool during this time. So we will definitely, as we get further um, guidance from DOL, um, we can build out our program and we'll get more information about the PUA program out to you all. Thank so you. So Mark, if, if people wanted to advocate that uh, folks who have been in school can receive that PUA funding and stay in school, who would they advocate to? Department of Labor? I think, yeah, I think that would be the, the, the right direction to go to. Okay. Um, to the deal, deal with DOL. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the reasons that we made sure to ask that question is because it is so impactful. And so I will make sure that you have it, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan, should you want to use it in your conversations with foundations, because we could always use their help. Absolutely. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yes. A question about broadband. To protect Minnesotans, we've seen school, healthcare, work, and entertainment move online. That's great for those who have adequate broadband devices and skills to use it. What can be done to increase access to devices, skills, and especially broadband in rural areas? And the writer of this question notes that internet providers do have low income programs, but those only affect 69% of rural homes with access to uh, the 2026 speed goals. So I wish that Commissioner Grove uh, was on this call because he would have loved answering this question. Um, 
uh, because like the rest of us um, in our administration, he sees the the manifold benefits of, of broadband uh, development. Um, and of course, you know, the thing about broadband is we know how to do it, but it takes significant investment and often takes a large state and federal subsidy to, to go to the most um, remote parts of the state. Uh, I want to be clear that, you know, that doesn't mean that we are not committed to giving everyone in the state access to the speeds of the 2026 speed goals, because as a questioner mentioned, access to adequate broadband is essential to, to fully participate and in many aspects of, of life. Um, we're having uh, discussions um, with, uh, we're having discussions um, within our state agencies about efficiencies that we can find on things like permitting and, and how we might build stronger uh, public-private partnerships and how to, to uh, really stretch those federal dollars out as, as far as possible. Um, but broadband is a perfect example of a broader point that that I want to make. Um, you know, we're going to get through this crisis. Uh, and when we do and we need to rebuild, uh, we don't want to lose sight of the, the priorities that existed before. Uh, COVID did not eliminate inequities and disparities. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, it's actually going to make them worse. So it's hard to see this right now, um, but the governor and I ask you, you know, not to, to lose sight of this vision of all of us being connected and the vision that we had for One Minnesota before this hit. Um, but, you know, I, I feel you and I, I wish uh, we would be able to do something quickly to expand broadband to, to meet the need in this moment, um, but it certainly will continue to be a priority. And I think the, the urgency has only been underscored by this crisis that we find ourselves in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned One Minnesota, which made me think of a plug that I need to put in here for the census. I know you also are a fan of the census. Um, you might have all seen that we are currently tied with Wisconsin in terms of census participation, and that is unacceptable. So we're going to need all of you to do your census right now so that we can win. Okay. That's my plug. I've got one more question um, and then I'll turn it back over to John to close us out. So last question, a couple of the questions that we received are about the overall timeline and issues that are critical for nonprofits in their planning. What is your best prediction for when the state will see the peak of the spike for illnesses? And when might we see guidance in terms of lifting stay at home restrictions and social distancing guidelines? And I'll just note that two of those questions specifically came from nonprofit summer camps who were wondering what mm. they should be doing. Yeah. Um, so one, just Marie, I appreciate your your plug on the, the census. Um, I am uh, jumping on a call later this afternoon with the Lieutenant Governor of Wisconsin. And so I want to be able to tell him that we will uh, continue to, to beat them um, mm -hmm. in our census response. Um, Although we're in troubled times, our rivalry with Wisconsin continues. Uh, but I, I um, for this particular question, I think everyone knows, um, you know, who's on the call that the governor is very data driven, and it's it's one of the the many traits that that we share. Um, as you know, there's a few different models out there, um, but we tend to like the work that's being done here at the University of Minnesota because it takes more specific um, uh, data for our state into account. Uh, the model that we've shared before predicts a peak in, uh, in infection somewhere early um, May to early June and peak hospitalization from mid-May to mid-June. And so, you know, we're always working to get updated modeling that reflects new information. And we'll share those with folks, um, with the public as, as we get it, because we want to be as transparent as possible. Um, I'd also encourage you, uh, for folks who are on here, to, to go to our, our COVID-19 uh, dashboard website where you can look at things uh, by region as well as uh, some of the, the data that's been disaggregated, I think is, is also helpful uh, to, to review. Um, but of course, uh, you know, many of you know that the, the stay at home order is set to expire on Friday. Uh, and our team is currently working 24-7 to determine the, the best action moving forward for the, the health and well-being of, of Minnesotans. 
we need to, to really be confident in our ability to ramp up our ICU capacity. That is the, the um, frankly, the, the piece that is really driving um, our, the stay at home order right now is our ability to just build out healthcare capacity um, and to keep our most vulnerable population safe and, and many other things before uh, need to be in place before we can lift the stay at home order. Uh, and so similar to to all other Minnesotans, we are eager to get back to our normal rhythms, but I, I can't let our desire to, to do that be the, the cause for bad decisions. So I think you can expect an update. I think the governor mentioned this earlier. You can expect an update in the next few days on, um, you know, uh, whether or not the stay at home order will uh, will continue. Uh, but certainly, uh, we know uh, that social distancing and, and our stay-at-home order now is, is impacting um, uh, the, the community spread of this virus, and, and, and you all are making a, a significant difference. So, um, I know uh, organizations that are planning for summer programming uh, are, are eager. I wish I could give you the answer that, you know, everything will be just fine next month, but I can't. Uh, and we will, again, just be using data. We'll be sharing that data. So just stay tuned for the next couple of days. We'll give an additional announcement um, and uh, we'll also be able to share some of that, uh, the, the data behind our, our decision making. But I, I can't, I certainly can't give you an answer now as to, to whether or not you'll be able to, to continue your summer programming. And as a mom of a seven-year-old, boy, do I wish I could. I totally understand, uh, and I also understand about the online learning starting today. That was a large topic of conversation on our morning staff call as well, as we all had children trying to figure out what they were doing. Um, John, can I turn it over to you to close us out? Yeah, thank you, Marie, uh, and thank you, Lieutenant Governor Flanagan and Mark Majors. Um, obviously, you know, from what we've heard, this is the most difficult situation with no easy answers, uh, and as you said, Lieutenant Governor, there are some already unacceptable situations that we need to change. And so uh, this will be, this is our, this is our generation's challenge. Uh, MCN gets a lot of questions from other organizations and supporters of nonprofits who want to know what decisions and how are other organizations coping, including what are they doing about their own staffing, uh, their own service delivery, uh, and their financial projections. MCN is going to be working uh, with the Federal Reserve Bank to conduct a survey to be able to tell the story of how boards and managers are responding, how this is affecting the nonprofit sector. Uh, so I hope those of you uh, on this call will also sort of respond to that survey and help share information with your peers about what is happening. Uh, a couple of final notes, MCN has posted a free resource of private funds foundations and corporate grant making programs uh, in a special edition of the grants directory. It's already now in its sort of updated second edition. So we're constantly getting new information that's available for free online. Uh, we mentioned before the April 8th, this Wednesday is a free briefing on how to apply for a payroll protection loan. This is the $350 billion pool forgivable for employers with other under 500 employees. Uh, so a big chunk of this could be really a, a key resource uh, during this, uh, this point of the crisis. Um, and the key is talking with your banker uh, in advance. Uh, the other uh, one last point uh, on April 10th, we have an online conversation with U.S. Senator Tina Smith uh, that's available as a free call that'll focus on unfinished parts of the CARES Act and also take ideas for a phase four stimulus package when Congress returns. And key difference between Congress and the state government is Congress can deficit spend. And so they've been going out and having a big stimulus package. Uh, so more on that on Friday. Um, let me give a big thank you to the governor and lieutenant governor's office for making this possible and everyone for joining us. We'll hold the next briefing in the, this series a week from today, April 13th at 1130, including, it sounds like, Deed Commissioner Grove. So uh, thank you for participating and please stay safe, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.